the stoic virtues help us to you know they guide us to solve problems and the problems we are trying to solve you know they they affect every part of people's daily lives you know they 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 affect whether people are killed or not killed you know it's it's an ethical challenge it's an enormous challenge hey everyone welcome to the active towns channel my name is john simmerman and that is prue oswin from sidelines traffic in the sunshine coast of australia and we're going to be talking about her work to encourage that the right type of active transportation uh, infrastructure is being put in in the communities and how she is outreaching to uh, community members especially parents uh, with school age children uh, to really hone in on what to do. So without further ado, let's get right to it with Prue. Prue, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Oh, thank you for having me, John. I'm really excited to be here. Well, I love to give my guests an opportunity just to introduce themselves. So uh, please uh, share who is Prue? <laughs> <laughs> I am an active transport engineer and I'm based in Queensland, Australia on the Sunshine Coast. Um, I didn't always work in this field. I started in the water industry after I studied engineering and I kept finding myself out on site. We were investigating sewers and I was trying to put in bikeways and I kept thinking, oh, this would be a nice place for a bikeway. So I've always ridden my bike everywhere, felt very passionate about active transport when I lived in in Melbourne and went to university. So uh, it took me a little while to get into active transport, but yeah, it's a really exciting field now that I'm here. And there's so much work to be done in terms of uh, keeping communities safe and uh, making our towns, you know, safe for people to walk and ride around. And it's just, you know, it's a very simple kind of desire to to be working towards or objective to be working towards. But yeah, there's there's plenty of work to be done there. Yeah, yeah, there sure is. And uh, uh, I have not visited Australia yet, but I would very much like to do so. And so I got curious. I'm like, okay, well, where in the world is she? <laughs> like, okay, so uh, if we, we've got the map all pulled up here. And uh, by the way, I used to live in Hawaii. So I used to live in the middle of that ocean right, right there. Uh, but yeah, okay. and you're on that coast, literally, <laughs> if we zoom in. Boom, here you are. And so you're in, is, is, am I getting the, the the name of this right? Is it Moffat Beach? I'm in Caloundra, actually. Uh, and so, you're in yeah, Caloundra. Just next to and, Beach. and that's just, yes. just south of there. Yeah. So I see that. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah that's Moffat kind Beach of is the next in that area. Yeah. And this is all um, basically referred to as the Sunside, Sunshine Coast. Is that correct? Yeah, we talk about the Sunshine Coast from all the way from Noosa down to uh, Caloundra and uh, Caloundra wow. South as well. So, um, yeah, there's lots of – originally they were little kind of villages and communities and now much of it has joined together. But we still have these really strong communities and uh, Caloundra, where I live, is a beautiful little town. It's a, it's a walkable town. It's, um, you know, you can walk to the beach, the schools, the sports fields, the town centre and the main street. So uh, we're, we're pretty lucky where we are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm seeing uh, uh, the beach right in here, and it looks like I see some <laughs> waves coming in. Uh, now, when I <laughs> lived in Hawaii, I used to be a surfer. Is it a is it kind of a surf community too? Uh, yes, we have Moffat Beach. is uh, a very good surf beach. You can't talk to me too much about surfing. I don't. I'm, I really can't catch waves, but um, I'm happy to go out there and sit on a board and pretend I'm, yeah, <laughs> I'm yeah. brave enough to catch one. <laughs> but yeah, I'm sure a lot of people will testify to it being um, yeah a great place for surfing as well. Yeah, fantastic. Well, and what I love about you know beach towns and, and and communities like this is that there is that sense of. Um, uh, what I call a culture of activity. You know, there's a, a certain amount of, you know, active living uh, is very much a part of the the DNA of the place. And so um, I used to, when I would hang out in, in beach communities, I just, you know, it was like the best way to get around is to walk and bike everywhere, really. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. It's, you know, we have this, you know, fairly, I think, interesting culture in that it is it's an active town and I think it's not a coincidence that I ended up here like when I came here you know the first thing I found were people swimming across the bay down at the beach each morning and it's this culture of of activity and and we're a morning 
you know, a morning culture as well where the best time of day is, you know, getting up really early and going surfing or bike riding or mountain biking. There's just people people doing stuff everywhere. So, yeah, it's lovely. And I think we need to think about that when we're thinking about our transport and things um, because the beach is this whole destination that we we are always aware of, you know, it's always part of our lives kind of. Yeah, yeah. Now, you had mentioned that you were very much involved in the, the water side of things, and, and you, you are an engineer, correct? Yes, yeah. I'm an engineer, yeah. Yeah. And uh, and, and you said that, you know, you, you kind of had like that active mobility was like sort of always there and that always a, an interest. What, what, what was that story, you know, you, you know, that origin story? What really got you to the point where it, I'm going to focus in on this? Uh, I think it was, um, I think there was a bit of luck involved as well. And I think, you know, if I had my time again, you'd kind of talk to young people and say, you know, find your passions, follow your passions and do that. And it was really obvious the whole time I was at university, I rode my bike everywhere as a child. That's what I did. I loved that, that freedom. And, but not just that, me and my friends would be sitting around in the pub and talking about how we could make cities safer for, for cycling. And we just, you know, it didn't make sense that it was so scary out there on our bikes and things. So, you know, if I looked back, I'd just say, look, that was a really big part of me um, from early on. So I'm not sure why I was I was in the water industry. I just think I, I thought that's what I should do because I studied environmental engineering. And then a job came up and because nobody was really trained in cycling infrastructure, a job came up in my local community and they were looking for an engineer and they're like, well, she's got a good background. And I'm like, Okay, so it was a really nice, you know, really a good way to transition and then start building my skill set in a local government, which is a great way to do it, especially with some really great mentors um, at that time and people who had been really progressive with active transport. Yeah. And it actually brings up a really good point, too, is that the training of engineers, and this isn't just in Australia, it's not just in North America and the United States, this is pretty consistent globally, is that engineering, you know, you, you learn the engineering and you learn how to think like an engineer and be an engineer, um, but you're not necessarily a, an expert in uh transportation engineering in, and in, in the case of, uh, in the United States frequently, it may only be a, a course or two or three in transportation planning and transportation engineering. And oftentimes what gets lost in that whole education process. And one of the, our biggest challenges with, in dealing with quote unquote tra- traffic engineers is that they have very little appreciation for uh, kind of what we're seeing on screen here, which is the human dynamics of what it means to have a, a, a mobility network. Yeah, I, I I definitely agree. And I think that, you know, having mentors that can help support you to take in the big picture is really important as I've, oh yeah, <laughs> there, there's just so, there's so much to that. And it's such a complicated network. I think um, one of the diagrams I gave you has the kind of three users that I always just map out in my mind in terms of for active transport, who we're planning for. And it's just so complicated when you think of that little boy on the screen there, you know, we're thinking about a a four-year-old that's, you know, an incredibly erratic user that we're trying to provide for and make this, um, this place, you know, safe. So yeah, this is, this is what I always have in mind when I'm thinking about active transport. I think about this, um, this erratic three-year-old who's, you know, you see this little kid on the scooter and I saw every time I see one of them, I'm just like, I just crack up laughing because it's hilarious. But basically, you know, they've scooted off behind them. There's a parent or a grandparent running down the road trying to keep them under control. They're like, yay, I'm free. You know, and we have to plan for this person on the network. We need to understand like how they're going to behave in a high risk situation, as well as someone who's got a vision impairment, someone with a wheelchair and everybody in between all of this. So it's, it's a really complicated kind of system. And, you know, it, that whole group of people can easily be lost when we're thinking about, you know, trucks and SUVs and all, all the different types of vehicles and, and things as well. So yeah, it, it's a complicated issue. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I really appreciate this particular diagram that you have uh, on here and we'll uh, um, sort of describe it for the listening only audience as well. So in the, it's essentially an, uh, 
a, a triangle. It's an upside down triangle or, or permit per pyramid, uh, upside down pyramid in, in the sense that uh, on top we have, as you said, the, the erratic three-year-old sort of darting around. And then, uh, then you have like this sort of uh, going across the top, you know, we have somebody who's, you know, running or jogging with their doggy, and then somebody who looks like they're walking with a cane. And at the far end there, of course, we've got somebody, like I said, vision impaired, vision impaired with a guide dog with a cane. And then down below in the, in the pointy end of the upside down triangle here, we, of course, as you mentioned, have somebody with a wheelchair. But what I love about the, the, this diagram and the way that you have this is uh, laid out is that it's sort of on this, you know, this, uh, uh, what's the word I'm searching for? We, we all are at different stages of, uh, becoming uh, less mobile and less able as time goes by uh, it, because very well, as we, as we get older, we, we could in fact lose our sight. You know, it doesn't necessarily Absolutely. mean you don't have sight, you know, your entire life as some people that is the case, but for, for many people, we could lose our mobility as we get older. Uh, you know, hopefully not, but that's the case, uh, you know, for many people. And I think somebody had once said that, you know, we're all at different stages of losing our abilities a, as time goes by. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And we have to, we need simple and easy models so that we could always keep that in mind. And I think I, I brought this one together because it's, you know, between if we provide for these extremes, then we can capture everybody in between. But we need a simple model because we're out there on site, we're thinking about problems, we're looking at diagrams and we need to be able to, you know, make sure we're not going to to miss anything there. So it's it's by mapping that out and it's just what happens in my head whenever I'm kind of looking at a site. How's this going to work for somebody who who can't see? How are they, you know, can they get across the road here? Is there something to support them to do that? Um, somebody who's looking after that little kid who might just zip off, is it going to be self-explaining for that person? And I think when I started out in this field, I actually, I had this background of, I used to ride my bike everywhere, everywhere around the city as a as a bike rider and not that many people actually commute by cycling at the Sunshine Coast. People use it for recreation and get around, but it was it's, when I started out, it was not that common, the Sunshine Coast. But I also spent a number of years competing at quite a high level as a triathlete and I went to Hawaii and did the Hawaiian Ironman there. So I had that kind of background as a sports rider as well. So I used to think, you know, when I first started out, I'm like, yeah, I've got it covered. I've done the commuter bike riding. I get around by bike and I've done the sports cycling, blah, blah, blah. And then I had children and I was like, oh, <laughs> oops, you know, and, and I didn't even know that I was missing stuff. You know, I'd see a school and I'd be like, yeah, we need to plan for active transport here. But, you know, really, I would like to say that I was ahead of the game and I really thought it through and I knew what I was doing, but I did not. You know, it just literally came along with my children. I went, oh my gosh, you know, as a bike rider, as someone who walks in, around my town, it just shrunk. Like we basically had to move to somewhere that had footpaths and things. So with that diagram, I don't want to let that happen again. I want to make sure I'm, you know, I'm not an older person yet, but I want to make sure I'm ahead of the game and thinking about that this time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is interesting. And, and, and I, you and I have that, that commonality of, of Ironman, um, as well. Um, and, uh, and then I also had the privilege of living in Kona too. So I was part of the actual world championships. Uh, I was one of the, the, the top volunteers, uh, within the organization. And so one of the things that I kept trying to do with active towns as an organization is trying to engage the more recreation and sport, uh, cyclists, as well as the athletes like tri uh, Ironman distance triathletes and trying to bring them along with understanding this dynamic that you and I are talking about, which is how important it is that people can get around their communities through active mobility and getting, you know, back to this, this image that we have on screen here of this child, you know, being able to walk to meaningful destinations, like to school, like to a park, like to a friend's house, and hopefully, you know, end up having that, that freedom and uh, ability, uh, both the self-efficacy, you know, of, of being able to do this, that I can do this, uh, but also being in a, a place, a, a community that embraces that and encourages that because it's inherently a safe place for them to be able to get around. 
and this is your website. So this is this is your landing page. This is your 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 website for your your, your organization uh, side sidelines traffic. Let's keep them safe. And uh, talk a little bit about launching your, your own firm. You, you mentioned and alluded to just a moment ago that you went to work for a municipality for a while and, and, and did that. So then you decided to strike out on your own. <laughs> yeah. Um, after I had children, I it was difficult for me to go back to work, actually. The, the organization I worked for, because the councils are very big here, uh, I was going to be moved to an office in a different town. I didn't actually want to work in a different town, only about 30 kilometres away from here. Um, But, you know, I had a young baby. I didn't want to be driving on a highway every day and going off to a different town. So that was one of the things that triggered um, me moving. And I went and actually worked for a female traffic engineer who was fantastic. I she she told me at that time, she's like, because I wanted to get some more traffic um, skills. So I was working in the cycling stuff, but I'm like, I can't change the road environment if I don't have general, general traffic skills. So working for her, and she was amazing. She's like, mums can do anything, Prue. They underestimate how much we can we can do. And she talked about when her children were young and how much she, you know, did, and she'd set up her own company. So I worked with her for a few years. And then as I seemed to do, it was it was kind of a little bit of luck. She she went off to do something else, and we had just won this big contract, which was about doing a an active transport plan, which was nearly all me. And she's like, "But you can do this, Prue. I will still direct it, and uh, you can run the project." And that's what triggered me to kind of launch my own company. So you know, my kids were still very young then. Um, but I was really fortunate because the active transport plan we were doing was a town that I'd lived in for a number of years. And so it was, and I'd been doing, it was lovely because I'd been doing Ironman training there and stuff. So I knew the network really well. And I think that lo- local knowledge in active transport planning is really important. It's such a fine grain network. And when we have these really big local governments, it's so complicated to try to prioritise what's uh, what needs to be done. So, you know, I loved being able to bring that knowledge of someone who'd lived in that area for a few years and be able to do that job well. So I kind of fell onto my feet a little bit um, from there. And then it's just grown from there. And it's, it's interesting. I've been doing, I don't know, I think it's, maybe that was about seven or eight years ago now, but it's it's just kind of in the last couple of years that I feel like my skill set has really come together and I've, I've got a lot more confidence in the types of problems I can solve. Uh, and, and that's really, it's a great feeling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, the other thing that I think we have in common too is um, uh, a love of uh, stoicism. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I I see one of your your slides that you did. You you've got the uh, the we need all four Stoic virtues uh, to support transport investment, and uh, I'm like, oh wow, that's cool. She has found a way to incorporate, uh, you know, the, the basically the 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 four virtues of of Stoicism, and uh, the four v- virtues of Stoicism are, are are something that you know right down the road from me here in Austin, uh, Ryan Holiday you know talks about. So yeah, I've been thinking about this too. I've been thinking about active towns and urbanism, and how do we bring in? Because when I'm you know I. I Every day I get up and I read the the Daily Stoic, and and I've been following uh, Ryan's work for many many years, and uh, and I've been thinking about this. It's like how do we bring like the the virtues, these four virtues of Stoicism? Um, uh, again, you know, you've got your, your wisdom, courage, temperance, and or moderation and, and justice into it, and boom, lo and behold, that's what you did. You 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 put it on. Uh, on a, on a slide for this. So, so talk a little bit about uh, your inspiration for bringing in wisdom, justice, moderation, and courage into the active transportation world. <laughs> oh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm so excited that, uh, yeah, you appreciate the, you appreciate this. It, it was a little bit, uh, far-fetched I thought but I thought you know I'm I'm talking on the Active Towns podcast so what's going through my head at the moment and you know I'm like how do we solve problems well the stoic virtues help us to you know they guide us to solve problems and the problems we are trying to solve you know they they affect every part of people's daily lives you know they 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 affect whether people are killed or not killed you know it's it's 
an ethical challenge. It's an enormous challenge. So um, I don't know what made me think of, of applying this, but it just seems like a really natural fit. And I, I really think that practitioners need to understand the context that they're working in, that this is a really enormous context. When I get feedback um, and I look at community requests about active transport projects, the they are emotive you know people are scared they're fearful they're fearful of crossing the road they're fearful of hitting being hit by a scooter and things so I guess that's what kind of triggered me to think hey can we put this model onto transport and it's it I could have populated this 20 times it's really easy so basically the fir- the four stoic virtues we have wisdom justice moderation and courage and wisdom I see as being hey we have really good technical guidance that's focused on safe and sustainable networks it's you know it's what the research tells us that we should be building to make our towns um oh you've got some great words for it and I'm not going to think of them right now but you know healthy fair great places to live that we can walk and cycle around and wisdom is about having informed decision makers and practitioners. There's a whole lot of work there in educating and continually training. It's not just a once-off thing because it keeps changing as well. So wisdom's that great technical guidance and that great capability to educate everybody who's involved in the decisions. Justice I see as about protecting people from harm. That's a justice issue. It's about protecting the climate, the, the future of the planet access for all don't displace place people and nature for roads because we're still we're still doing that we're destroying part of the planet to build these roads as well so that's a justice issue moderation so the temperance one is always the one that I forget and is really uh, quite a tricky one but you know I've just put some words in there don't rely on mega projects to solve problems you know I see that in the strong towns website as well it's you know these tiny little interventions that we make at a community level can really change people's lives connect up communities moderation if we think about vehicle speeds you know we have really high speed roads going through uh, communities and places where people are walking cycling like, that's not moderation <laughs> um, don't forget investments in little trips in the game um, and the final one I, I put that in red I put courage because we we can't keep just responding to what people you know, a demanding in terms of expanding roads. So we need the courage to actually go back to the wise decisions with the technical guidance in the courage to invest in safer and more sustainable solutions, even when they're not the most popular um, and that courage to build wise projects. And I think it's really worth articulating it. And one of the things that I learned when I was doing Ironman and, and training for those real endurance events, I had a couple of events where I was running along. I was like, oh, I feel terrible. This is awful, you know. And then I didn't, what I didn't realise at the time that I was running up a hill. I was doing something hard. And if I'd known I was going up a hill, I would have had my mindset adjusted to we're doing hard stuff now, Prue. So just, you know, toughen yourself up. And I think we need to you know, give ourselves that pat on the back going, this is going to be a hard bit. This is a hard project, you know, have the courage to go through with it, but it's not going to be this hard forever. So I guess that's why I wanted to articulate that as well too, so that, you know, people didn't realise, you know, think they were always going to be running up a hill. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I appreciate that. And I really just, I, I, I applaud you for, for uh, going through that mental exercise to, to put this together in, in the, uh, the four uh, stoic virtues, uh, framework here, I think this is brilliant and I'm so glad that you did it. And, uh, yeah, I can remember also doing, you know, races and, and even training sessions where, you know, it's easy for us to, you know, to, to start getting down on ourselves and, and, you know, the devil gets inside your, on your shoulder and starts, you know, whispering in your ears, just, uh, just quit, just give up, et cetera. So there has to be a certain amount of courage to, to think that it's going to get better and stick with it. The persistence of, you know, working through it. Um, I had a couple of times where I, I know I was, I don't know, I was probably like halfway through, uh, the marathon portion of one of the Ironmans I was participating in and, or no, it was actually the bike in Lake Placid and my knee was just like super, super painful. And I'm like, oh my gosh, do I have like a, a serious injury here? And I'm like, just relax, you know, have the courage to keep going and be patient. And sure enough, you know, it, it worked itself out. It just kind of 
magically went away. But at the same time, if I had freaked out in the moment, like so often we end up freaking out in the moment when there's a resistance to some sort of active transportation uh, thing, we're so tuned in to like resistance of people complaining that we like freak out and give up. And so we have to be persistent, give people the, that opportunity to let the change sort of, you know, give them that opportunity to, to really, you know, make it work. And I love the fact that you, the way you put moderation in there in terms of, and, and mentioning, uh, you know, strong towns, you know, like, like Chuck says, you know, what's that next little step that we can do that gets us uh, heading in that direction. And that kind of helps with that persistence too. If we just do a little change, give people an opportunity to respond to it and then continue and then be persistently better year after year, time after time. So, yeah. I love your uh, your knee analogy. I'm going to think of your knee every time I've got a, um, a there's a reaction to a project. Uh, my first the first time I did a line marking plan, uh, which was in a low speed street to put cycle symbols on the end of the road on the middle of the road, which was a little bit of an unusual uh, treatment. And there was a lovely engineer that I was working for, and so we put these symbols in, which is you know it, it they're still there today, and we got these phone calls coming up. It, immediately afterwards and the engineer said to me don't worry about it Prue you know they'll call for a couple of days and then um you know then they'll die off and the the symbols will be there for the next 10 years and you know it's 10 years later the symbols are still there and I really appreciate that you know that approach where he just allowed you know the community to accept respond and then settle down and we don't instantly react so yeah just like your knee if we you know instantly overreact or react to that it's not allowing that that time to calm down yeah it's a cool one (laughs) yeah and when you say die off, you really mean the, the numbers of calls were going to die off. We're not actually saying that the, <laughs> that the people are dying. <laughs> no, no, it was the telephone calls. Thank you for connecting me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, and this actually kind of relates to what we have on screen right now, which is um, a sort of a difficulty rating in delivering an, uh, active transportation uh, types of infrastructure projects, because to your point, you know, some things uh, are really, really big lifts. Some things are very, very difficult to, to do. Um, uh, it, I'll, I'll let you kind of frame this up for uh, the audience in terms of, uh, you know, that extreme difficult all the way to, hey, this, this stuff is pretty easy. Doesn't mean that people won't have reactions to it. Uh, but overall, it, it, these seem to be a little bit easier to, to bring to fruition. Yeah. In my mind, I have thought we, different towns and cities are at different stages when it comes to active transport. Just in my local area, if we look at the the capital city, if we look at Brisbane, you know, there's bicycle user groups, there's a structure to the city where everybody's going into the CBD and a lot of emphasis on getting a lot of commuter cyclists into the, the CBD, which is something they're working on and is really important. These are the kind of projects that I would call difficult or extreme projects because it's really contested space. You have to take parking away or or traffic capacity or something to get it in. But they are at that stage of evolution because they've got a lot of people in the community advocating for it. They've got a lot of congestion, you know, and they've got things to help get it through. It's still hard. There's other areas like where I live where we don't have a lot of people kind of pushing and advocating for kind of commuter cycling infrastructure, but we still have a need to, it doesn't mean that we need a whole culture change to get active transport happening in our town. I've engaged a lot with school communities and, you know, these communities are ready and raring to go for active transport. They're, you know, they're putting in petitions asking for safer infrastructure. The parents want kids to be able to walk and cycle to school and the little projects that they need to facilitate that are often fairly simple. They're things like crossings and connecting, you know, the high school to the sports facilities, which are often is often not contested space. It's not like trying to put a bikeway in in the middle of a CBD kind of area. So um, I 
I used the difficulty ratings from mountain biking and they fitted surprisingly well. Just I just used the definitions that they had there, you know, so the extreme ones are difficult even for experts. So it's that thing where we go back to the stoic virtues and go, we're going to have to have courage to do this stuff. But there's these, you know, these lovely easy projects and things like putting bikeways in space that isn't contested. And, and most of these will be in in most places, but there's often some lovely creek corridors and things where there might be a little old path there and we can upgrade that and make it better. So that can, is an example of an easy type of project. So I guess I'm, I'm trying to use this to encourage all towns to think about what kind of projects do they want to take on. Even in big cities, there are so many easy projects because these are often in the suburbs and the neighbourhoods and it's about connecting that those up together. So I don't know if I made that any clearer, actually. <laughs> no, no, I, I think it's, it's brilliant too, to, you know, it, I think intuitively we know that uh, some projects are easier to, to, to push forward and, and, and do. And, you know, especially like, for instance, if there's, um, it, it's an area, like you said, where there's contested space, where there's, you know, it, it, it's like, oh, okay, there's going to be a major compromise that someone's going to have to, you know, give here. And uh, in the case of like in, in North America, where we have all these strodes and we're like, oh, okay, come on, guys, you, you've got like five or six or seven lanes here. You can get rid of one and give us one so that we can create a safer uh, active transportation corridor through here. But at the same time, it's still a strode. You know, it's still kind of a more dangerous, you know, environment. So even though it, it, these are these are kind of difficult things, to, you know, to be able to do when you're looking at going after a limited amount of real estate that's out there and redefining it. Uh, yeah, we get lots of strong opinions and lots of uh, folks uh, start freaking out. Now, you, you had mentioned a little bit there that you, you started really focusing in on um the children and kids and getting to school. Um, now one would think that this would be easier in that easier bucket, you know, because it's, I mean, this is, this is like obvious kids should be able to get to school, uh, through walking and biking. Yeah. Well, I, I do think it's in the easy bucket. I think it's something we can do. And we just, we have a slightly different situation in Australia because I think in in America, there's a lot more zebra crossings and pedestrians have right of way at pedestrian crossings. We don't use them as much here. So we have a lot of roads that, you know, the only way to get across is to pick a gap in traffic and the traffic is not going to help you at all. And these are kind of major blockers to getting around communities. So even places that might have good pathway networks, as soon as you get to the, the road, you know, there's a whole large proportion of the population that they will have no way of getting across the road unless they can get a gap, you know, they can pick that gap um, and no one's going to help them. So a few years ago, uh, maybe about three years ago, I did my first survey of parents to plan infrastructure around a local primary school. And when I got the result, and basically I did like a spatial survey, I had put out a survey tool, I it had maps and really simple questions. Where do you need safer crossings? Uh, where are you concerned about your kids when they walk or cycle to school? Where do we need new pathways? So nothing, you know, complicated here. And I asked them some questions about the type of crossings they liked as well. And when we got the survey results in, it was really interesting. The school had about 400 kids. Uh, we got 100, 110 survey responses. The parents and citizens group said normally when we put out a survey, we get seven responses and it's the same seven, same seven parents. So instantly I'm like, well, the parents are engaged on this issue. You know, we had kind of one in four families from the school had responded to the survey. And the points on the map were amazing. Even though we had 110 people and I gave them 10 dots each to say where they wanted safer crossings and things. So they had a lot of dots, but they came up with like maybe 10 places in that covered most of the town where they needed safer crossings. So rather than this exercise being something that, you know, said, you know, the community coming back saying we want everything fixed everywhere, they didn't. They came back and they they basically put together a cohesive plan of this is what needs to be fixed so our kids can walk and cycle to school. And the slide you've got there as well, we asked them about is road safety a barrier? So we asked them whether they um, strongly agreed or somewhat agreed with the, the comment, road safety is the main reason I don't let children walk or cycle to school. And kind of seven out of 10 parents 
um, strongly agreed or somewhat agreed to that. So it, I think that has really changed my practice. That's what really opened my eyes to this idea that there's a lot of easy projects out there and there's actually with these spatial tools we've got, we can we can get community data straight in there to plan it around what they need. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I I learned something new today in in looking at uh, you know the the materials that you sent through. I learned that you all have yellow crossings. <laughs> what's uh, what's going crossings. on with this? Is this new? Is uh, is this a, a new adaptation? The the yellow crossings. Well, it's interesting, actually, and it has been a little bit controversial, the yellow crossings. Uh, they made their way around the world on LinkedIn. So this this treatment here is called a raised priority crossing treatment, something we do at continuous pavement treatments. There's all different kind of varieties of them. So our, our state government put together some guidance which said we need to use give way signs and line marking to establish priority to the path users. It originally came from a cycling treatment. If it was a cycleway, we'd make it green because that's what cycling infrastructure is. But this isn't, it's a shared path, so we can't use that colour. A lot of the time people just continue the footpath colour and continue it as grey. This path is right next to a school. Now, my considerations, because I recommended the yellow here, is that the drivers need to give way to path users here, but we also want the path users to be aware that they are entering a crossing. When it comes to children, we need to be able to to make it explicit. So, like, it, it needs to be something that it, we can describe so that we can teach children. So we want it to look like the pathway, but we also want it to be something that we can describe. And that's where yellow is a good colour because we can say where the path turns yellow, check for cars. And I've, I've, with my own children, when we use the green cycling treatments, I've done the same thing. I say where the path turns green, they have to give way to you, but you check for them just in case. So that's where the kind of the yellow came from. We also need this really good contrast between the, the ramp and the raised crossing and the footpath as well. And we also have some guidance in Australia that says if you want to re-emphasize, really emphasize pedestrian crossings, you can paint it yellow. So it was a whole lot of kind of guidance that, you know, a few things that came together, but that was the the decision to make it yellow. Now, I know some practitioners don't, don't like the yellow. Uh, when I talk to the community, they like it, the school likes it. To me, it feels safe. It also you come down the street and you see these crossings and it's like, yeah, there's a school here. There's something important going on here. Um, and in every one of my surveys, it pops up that these side roads are a place of concern for parents with children walking or riding to school. So you can see the little, there's a heat map there. That's an example of one of the outputs of the studies that shows, hey, these are the the, the problem areas and, and those crossings were something we treated. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and I think it's incredibly uh, important to, to just acknowledge the fact that a, you know, we, we have this opportunity, I think, to offshoot or offset a lot of these short trips and being able to encourage safe zones around schools and getting to parks and really throughout the community. I mean, kids should be able to get around their community, uh, without having to, to worry about, you know, being in a hostile environment. But in reality, it's it, it's not that easy, and it just doesn't happen that way. You've got a, a, an, a the Australian care related uh, travel uh, graphic here. I want to pop over and take a look at this, and 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 talk through this as well. Yeah. So this is something. Uh, I guess we see so much so much investment on. Um, expanding roads to provide for these trips to school, um, not to school, to, to work. You know, we, we're always looking at peak hour and we're always talking about work trips and things. And I'm just going to hold up Caroline Criado Carez's book, Invisible Women. Yeah, boom, and right here. this is where all kind of, there it is. Yep. It all came together for me. She talks about how many trips are related to care related travel. So that's number of trips made for caring purposes, um, for children, for uh, people, other people. Um, and it almost equals the number of work trips if you put them all together. But unfortunately, like in our travel household travel survey, they're not put together. So that's why I've kind of drawn that out here to say pick up, drop off delivery. That's where the, the 
parents taking the kids to school, taking them to sport, that all comes into that. So that's where we need to see, look at this together to say, this is an enormous part of our congestion issue as well as a safety issue. And I guess I do that so that we can kind of try and access some of that, that money that is about congestion and, and saying it's worth investing in this. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, we've, we've gotten into a bad habit in the United States and North America of citing schools far, far away from, from people. <laughs> Whereas before, you know, we, we, you had neighborhood schools and, and it was very, very common for people to be able to get, um, you know, to school by walking, biking, you know, including like the, the, the higher grades, the, the, the high school level. Talk a little bit about uh, what you guys are seeing as well. Yeah, I think that's there seems to be a trend towards these bigger schools and we're really creating almost unsolvable problems in making the catchments bigger, making the number of students attending the schools bigger and it gets to a point where, you know, it doesn't matter how well your transport network's designed trying to get, you know, over 2,000 kids into this this area in a 15-minute period twice, twice a day is just going to cause havoc on the network. So that's something that you know, there's there's people pushing, you know, against to keep these catchments relatively small. I think the other issue we have as well is we have a tendency to build mega sports precincts now and it's, you know, creating the same problem again on the weekend as well and that's often apart from the school as well and we have this, you know, then we create all these additional trips from the schools to the mega sports precincts. So this is something where, yeah, keeping the catchments small uh, so that they are solvable problems is part of the, the planning. And all this stuff can be so easily missed because kids aren't, you know, in the workplaces and the people who are doing a lot of the caring duties for children are less likely to be in the workplaces because they're more likely to be sharing their duties, you know. So that's where I think this, these gender issues are really important and we need to be really thinking about it like I wasn't before I had children. You know, every time we're thinking about, hey, this mega sports precinct that's about to be built out on the edge of town, how are all those kids going to get there? We need to be aware of raising that again and again. <laughs> it's just the kind of stuff we're likely to miss. Yeah. One of the biggest problems that we have in uh, in North America is, and I suspect that this is the same, you know, around the globe is is that there's this inclination towards towards safetyism and and you know looking at things from the perspective of uh, oh we need to just educate you know the, the kids and you know the kids need to you know be aware and, and all of that, but. It's I, I think you can only go so far, you know, with that, because, you know, we, we then put on, you know, this particular slide, we pay homage. And believe me, this happens a lot on my podcast here is that we, you know, start talking about the experience of the Netherlands and, you know, the Stop the Child Murder campaign, the Stop the Kindermort, because I think it was really important to understand that at the at the basis of this is that the parents, when they were protesting, they were like, no, this isn't appropriate. We need to create a system that just isn't, you know, putting our families at risk. We need a change in the way that we're approaching these these types of things. But the next slide just really made me chuckle because then I see, you know, children's safety in Australia, and it's basically a fence around a pool. And I, I, I have to chuckle about that because, you know, when, when you have these two slides side by side, you know, one after the other, you're like, <laughs> you, you get it. You know, it's like we can't just keep, you know, this concept of, oh, let's victim blame. And, oh, OK, well, then what we're going to do is we're just going to fence <laughs> the kids off from from living you know, from life. Oh, do you have pool fences in America? Yeah, we do. Yeah. You do have full fences in America. Uh, <laughs> it's interesting. I I put that slide up about the Stop Child Murder campaign because I think in Australia a lot of the time we try to just build these Netherlands-style cycleways and they didn't start by taking contested space and building, 
you know, this cycleways into all the difficult areas where adults were driving. They started with the children who don't have licences, who have very short trips to make and who were getting killed because they don't have alternative options. We, I don't hear it so much anymore, but a few years ago I would hear people blaming the helicopter parents and it's like, hang on. And my first survey taught me about this. I thought, am I becoming a helicopter parent? I'm really not comfortable with these crossings and my kids using them and um, I'm just getting too risk averse after my time in traffic. And then when I got the first survey back and I asked people, how concerned are you when your child uses this crossing? 90% of the parents felt like me. And I, I applied my safe system principles. I'm like, if they make a mistake, what happens? There's a 90% chance they end up dead or seriously injured. That's, you know, that's just not right. And I'm not crazy. That that road network is crazy and we need to do the hard work and we need to start with children and getting this infrastructure in that that if they make a mistake and they're children they will they don't get killed or seriously injured and if we don't do that work then parents will put their kids in cars to be sure that their kids don't get killed or seriously injured on the way to to school so I find our road safety guidance that we have now a fantastic lever to push for what we need for kids to walk and cycle to school. And my objective when my kids walk and cycle to school, my number one objective is that they don't get killed or seriously injured, (laughs) which is 100% in line with our road safety strategies and things now. So I I feel like we are at this lovely time if we wisely apply our road safety guidance that we can build the infrastructure that people want to walk and cycle around. (laughs) Right, right, yeah. Well, and I think it's it's interesting, too, because you, you brought up a good point there is that if a, if a mistake happens, you know, is it going to be a fatal mistake? And I think a, a big part of that is getting back to the infrastructure and saying, are we encouraging um, through our design slower speeds? Because that really helps a it, with slower speeds, motor vehicle speeds, many of those those collisions are simply avoided because they can be avoided because of the slower speeds. And if a if a collision does happen, if it's a slower speed, the likelihood of a a fatal uh, outcome goes down dramatically. Whereas if the if the you know, the speed creeps up even just a few kilometers per hour, miles per hour, et cetera, it goes up exponentially. So speed is such a huge thing of getting those, that traffic calming done. And I think that is part of uh, what's, what's happening here too, is planning for infrastructure for walking and riding to school. A big part of that has to also be, what are we doing with the automobile traffic around schools too? Yeah, absolutely. And speed, it's, we, we need to tackle it on all, all the different fronts we can. You know, if we can get precinct-wide speed limit um, reductions, then that's going to help. If we can get it on a street, then that's going to help. A lot of what I do is pinpoint the places where we need those, those road crossings and aim that we get 30 k's an hour at that crossing point. So, yeah, whenever we're looking at interventions in these places, and this is a community of about 10,000 people on the map here, and just through one school study, these are all the locations we identified. Yeah, so that's that's one of the crossings that the, the parents found concerning, <laughs> as you can imagine. And I went out, you know, when I was out there on a Sunday afternoon, it was terrifying to me as an adult, let alone for children. So we can tackle speed, you know, with the, the street, we can tackle it with the precinct or like in this situation, we can raise those crossings and then we can get our speeds from 50 k's an hour at the crossing to 30 k's an hour. We've got people's, the driver's foot on the brakes and ready to respond if there is someone walking there. So whenever I'm recommending a crossing, it's I'm always recommending a raised crossing now. So these are just some of the outputs of some of the studies I've done and just gives an idea of the kind of things that pe- where people kind of places that people are concerned about kids safety so in our roundabouts in Australia we didn't ever have guidance that said you had to have a pedestrian crossing that gives people walking priority and so it's really difficult to cross at roundabouts and now in the last kind of 18 months Queensland has brought in guidance that says for new roundabouts you should provide a pedestrian crossing there that gives pedestrians priority over cars because otherwise it's just too complicated and if you think back to that little triangle with someone with a vision impairment um, or someone in a wheelchair trying to pick a gap in that situation is really difficult. Yeah. 
Well, what's interesting too is that when we look at the um, the design um, that, like, say, the the, the Dutch uh, roundabout design where they prioritize safe crossings for people walking and biking, um, kind of reminds me a little bit of your your raised crossing that you have here with your um, with your yellow. Uh, the, they build in that design in in those types of roundabouts where uh, there there is a buffer area there so a, a motor vehicle can come up, wait, yield for the person walking or biking uh, to get across the road, and then they can proceed without you know gumming up the 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 roundabout uh, because I, I and I really do love roundabouts, but I always preface and and, and say uh, that. Specifically, I really love the Dutch style roundabouts where pedestrian and cycling priority um, are there because otherwise it's the roundabout tends to behave more like a through traffic mechanism prioritizing motor vehicles. Yeah, the roundabouts for, for me, I think they go from my one of my least favorite treatments when they don't have that pedestrian, at least pedestrian priority because um, cyclists can, when they're lower speed, when they have that, they might be able to share. And to when they have the priority crossings like the Dutch style roundabouts, and we have a lot here with raised crossings, they're my favourite treatment. You don't have to wait. The vehicles are going low speed and it's amazing. So it's quite amazing that by putting those crossings, they can go from the worst to the best, I think, <laughs> in lots of situations. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, you, and, the, and, and speed, again, is the key thing. The design speed of the, the roundabout has to be, uh, you know, using in, in miles per hour, I like to say a, a, a 15 mile per hour design in kilometers. It would be something right around the 30 kilometer or less, uh, you know, speed design so that it encourages, you know, it's tight enough. And also it's not a multiple threat. It's one lane in each direction. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's, yeah, we've got, there's some other sustainable safety principles that I really like as well. And they talk about predictability. And I think sometimes where we even have the speed under control for people walking and cycling, but it's a really unpredictable environment. And anyone who is traveling with children or something, you've already got your own micro unpredictable environment let alone adding, you know, multiple lanes of traffic and things as well. I, I show this picture. It's a picture of a mum with about um, with two or three children standing on a tiny little refuge island in the middle of the road. And I showed it at an engineering conference once and, and after the presentations I was talking to people at night and they said, that picture, you know, that mum is working so hard to keep those children safe and they it really resonated with them and I think you know that's why it's important having these pictures because that's what I was thinking too I was like oh look she's like actually grabbing one she's checking for the other at the same time as trying to pick a gap in traffic it's it's a really difficult task <laughs> now what would the, des the design speed typically be for a, a street such as this is this leaning more towards the 50 kilometer per hour this treatment is in this situation it's 50 um but the picture you showed before where it's a similar island um, and there's a truck that's a 60 kilometre an hour environment so um, and possibly higher. So this treatment is something we're only allowed to put the zebra crossings on roads that are 50 kilometres an hour. So what's been done in the past is where it's higher than 50 kilometres an hour, this is the treatment we use. So this is something why it's really important to do these school studies with parents to, to find out you know, how they feel about it because that guidance is not supporting them to let their kids walk and cycle to school. And one of the most kind of compelling questions I ask is how concerned are you when your children are using this kind of crossing? And it comes up as about 90% of parents very concerned or somewhat concerned on this type of crossing. So that's where I turn it around and say, well, I don't think the parents are being helicopters here. You're not passing the parent test in terms of terms of safety and if we want kids walking and cycling to school we need to, to pass this parent test I don't know did uh, the parent test comes from the pub test which I think is a bit outdated do you have a pub test in in America or is that just an Australian thing where you talk about having to pass a pub test it's the first I'm hearing it um, so it might be an Australian thing but I'm just I'm still just shocked at the the speeds that uh, that you're dealing with here I mean it, it kind of goes back to you know the, the strode conversation of, you know, uh, these, 
these roadways are trying to be both streets and roads at the same time. And, you know, again, any, any speeds north of 30 kilometers per hour, the fatality rates just go you know, sky high. And so, it, you know, in reality, and this is one of the things that the Dutch are, are starting to come to grips with, is they've been studying the, the fatality, serious injury and fatality rates on their 50 kilometer per hour streets and comparing that to their 30 kilometer per hour streets. They're getting to the point now where they're like, hey, if we're talking about in the city centers and in residential areas, that's all going to be lowered down to 30 kilometer per hour. Whenever there's a situation of it being a 50 kilometer per hour street uh, or higher, then you've got completely separated infrastructure and completely separated underpasses or overpasses, you know, or whatever the case may be, uh, so that there's less of that mixing and and certainly not a, a situation like this where you know the 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 family has to dart across and use a uh, you know, a, a small little island and maybe being exposed to, you know, 50 kilometer per hour uh, motor vehicle speeds. It's going to be more. It's it's often more than 60 as well. So that's, yeah, yeah. So this is, yeah, we, we are still back at the, the point where we need to change this, but um, it's it's been really good getting that community data because I've found that practitioners are really responsive to that once we have that data set that says, hey, 90% of parents are very concerned about this and, and there's all other ways we can argue it, but, you know, this is what has got it across the line for me. So that's where I think I've been a little bit more vocal ever since I started doing those parent surveys and things because I'm like, hey, the, the community is quite consistent in their messages and it's a call to action for us. But, yeah, it's I'm, – I'm glad you pointed that out because it, it's an extreme situation and uh, it's – and fortunately it's very typical in Australia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And again, uh, your website again here is Sidelines uh, Traffic and uh, the different services that you do provide to your communities and in, in, in your area. Do you mostly work right in your uh, your jurisdiction, your area there or are you national? Uh, I do a little bit of uh, a little bit of everything when I'm doing physical projects. It's usually local projects when it's like planning for infrastructure around schools. But I uh, also I do a number of different things, running training courses. So I'm one of the presenters. We have a raised crossing training course, which I do with um, Safe System Solutions, and also some of the national guidance projects and things I'm on. So you know, there's there's local st- state when it comes to guidance and training um, and national there as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, by chance, uh, will you be able to make it out to the Velo City Conference in Belgium this coming year in June? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. It's a it's a very busy year. Um, it's 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 looking pretty busy. So I'm I'm not sure that would be and. Amb- ambitious to try to uh, <laughs> get that in. Are, yeah, are well, you going? You, you, last year, I will be there. And last year, uh, uh, quite a few Aussies were there. Uh, they're, they're really pushing to see if uh, they can have uh, um, Sydney host uh, Velo City uh, in, in the coming years. So I'm not sure where that application process is, but uh, that might be an opportunity for easier. me to come down under and, and come hang out oh. with you. Yeah. But, um, Perfect. Right. Is there anything <laughs> that we haven't mentioned yet that you'd like to leave the audience with? The only thing, and I think we've kind of touched upon it, but and it's completely in line with what you're saying with active towns, but um, what I've found in my work is that communities really are experts of their own neighbourhoods. And when we query those communities and find clever ways to collect their knowledge, then it can really inform our decision making. And it's up to us to, to find these establish these clever ways of collecting their stories. Like I really like the spatial surveys. It's easy to pass on and communicate and analyze. So I think we are at a great time with the tools we've got available for collecting this information and then, you know, feeding that into the better outcomes that we need. So yeah, I think that's the thing I'd like to leave off on maybe. (laughs) Fantastic. Well, Prue Osmond, it has been an absolute joy and pleasure having you on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, John. It's been really fun. (laughs) Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Prue. And if you did, please, hey, give it a thumbs up. 
leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And if you are enjoying this content, please consider supporting my efforts. Uh, you can do so easily. Just head on over to activetowns.org, click on the support button, and there's several different options, including Patreon. And by the way, Patreon supporters uh, do get access to all this content early and ad-free. So there is that. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I really do appreciate it. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me a Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.